Hello, adventurers. We are on the air for another episode of Adventure Talk Live. And today I have the pleasure of being joined by a TV host, photographer, writer, adventurer, and just general badass, Ryan Pyle. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Glad, glad to have you on here, man. You've been all over the place. You've traveled all over the world, uh, various forms of, of media, just all kinds of stuff. Um, you're originally from Canada, right? I am. I'm originally from Toronto, Canada. I was born and raised there uh, and was you know, an aspiring young basketball star for most of my youth. Um, and, uh, and I had dreams and ambitions of playing professional, which never came true. And that kind of led me to wanting to travel around the world. I played Division One basketball in Canada for the University of Toronto. Okay. I, was a, I was a point guard. And uh, by the time, you know, I was 22 years old, it was obvious that I wasn't going to be able to play pro or play anywhere <laughs> um, beyond college. So I just kind of decided I was going to travel and see the world. So I went to China. That was kind of my first stop and I fell in love with it. Well, I bet as a Canadian point guard, you, you stood out in China at first, but you've since made it your home. I have. Yeah. And, and it's funny, you know, when you grow up as a young athlete, you don't grow up very well-rounded uh, as a human being. Like, you know, you, you train like four or five, six hours a day. Um, you know, you eat, sleep, drink, you know, your sport, whether it's basketball or hockey or American football or, or whatever, baseball. Um, but you don't have any other hobbies. So, you know, my mind and all my energy was so focused on, you know, academics and, and sport um, that I didn't really give myself a chance to like think about writing or think about photography, or think about like any other artistic adventure or any other artistic pursuit. And then once I, um, once my basketball career was over, all of a sudden, like I had all these other interests that had been suppressed. Uh, yeah. And then they just kind of overflowed within me. And that happened at the exact same time that I moved um, to China and, and started exploring China. So that's kind of how I got into storytelling and writing and photography is because I was a terrible uh, basketball player. <laughs> gotcha. Well, uh, <laughs> what a story. Well, I think the China was the the first thing of yours that I saw. So I, I think it was, I first saw it in an interview somewhere. And then I went and, uh, and actually watched the video of your trek around China. So for people who aren't familiar about that, uh, just, I guess, a quick summary of that. You circumvented or circumnavigated China on a motorcycle. Yeah, so uh, back a few steps. So when I went to China originally, I went um, to tell stories. So I started writing and, t and doing photography work. And I worked with like the New York Times, Time Magazine, Newsweek, Forbes, Fortune, covering China. And this was kind of a very exciting time. It was just before the Beijing Olympics. Uh, everyone wanted to know more about China. It was really good timing for me. Um, but then after that Beijing Olympics and of course the financial crisis in 2008, mm -hmm. uh, the publishing industry really fell apart. So I decided to move into video and television. And for years I had been kind of part of the machine that was giving the world this information about China uh, through the New York Times and Time, Newsweek, Forbes and Fortune. Um, but you know, the stories were very repetitive. It was like factories, pollution, you know, all the yeah. problems that China was having. But when I was going on vacation from my work and traveling all in China and backpacking in China and taking train trips out to the desert, I was seeing like a totally different part of China and no one was writing about that or taking pictures about that. So in 2010, I wanted to ride a motorcycle all the way around China and film my experience uh, to show people just a totally different side of China that they, than they were seeing in the media. And of course, I was part of that media that was giving them this one-sided, you know, vision. Um, yeah. So we wrote, yeah, so my, I got my brother on with me um, and he had never been to China before. And of course, I was kind of an expert by this stage. And we rode motorcycles um, like 13 or 14,000 miles all the way around China, 65 days, went to yeah. Mount Everest base camp. And the goal was nothing more than number one, you know, stay safe. But number two, just show people this different side of China that they've never seen before. And that was our goal. And it was amazing. And it actually launched my television career because we had, we ended up, you know, we filmed it without a broadcast partner. We filmed it without knowing if it was going to be like a TV show or a documentary film. We just filmed it because we thought it'd be cool. 
And uh, and then eventually we ended up making a six part TV show, which you can watch on Amazon Prime or Vimeo or in, if you're in the US. Yeah, I mean, that that's amazing. And, and I think so much of what you, I, I guess, were kind of fighting against in that journey is originally what I was familiar with. I guess you think I think of how I interact with China, which is mostly the mass produced consumer goods. So I do my tendency was to just think of, I guess, Eastern or Southeastern China, just, you know, dense cities and factories and smog. And I think you've revealed a whole nother world there. That's just huge. Everything from jungle to mountaintops to all kinds of crazy places. Yeah, it's true. And, 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 um, I made another series in China called extreme Trek sacred mountains, where I trekked around four sacred mountains in Tibet. Uh, the Tibetan part of China, and uh, and that was amazing too. And and you know, since then I've traveled all around the world. I make another show called Extreme Treks with BBC. Uh, you know, where we filmed in Uganda and Jordan, Oman, Peru, Bolivia, the U.S. You know, Italy, um, Jesus, Papua New Guinea, Laos, Russia, Iceland, Argentina. Like we've been all over the world, and we've been very lucky. But you know, still to this day. Uh, with all the places I've had the chance to travel, China still has, in my mind, as I guess a professional traveler, professional adventure, China still has some of the most amazing wilderness and most wide open spaces in the world. And and the way I judge that is, you know, there's a feeling you get in your heart when you're like 10 days away from the nearest road or the nearest village, where you're like, we're out there, man. Like you can feel yeah. it. You don't get that. You don't get that everywhere, um, but I get that every time I go out in China when we're because we're in really it's so easy to get out into a really remote place in China um, versus, you know, even Argentina when we climbed at Concagua, which is 24,000 feet, you know, we were up, you know, we successfully climbed that. But, you know, we were, you know, we were quite close to the to the towns and villages nearby. Um, you know, there's people all over. But in China, you can find real wilderness. Um, that just takes everything else that's available, you know, to a whole nother level. Yeah, that that's incredible. And, and do you think the thrill of that is mostly geographic just by just the amount of landmass? I mean, I know you've written so much about just the variety of cultures that you're interacting with and the, the different things you see along the way outside of just the geography. Right. I think the geography definitely helps. And, and I think Russia probably has a lot of wide open spaces as well. I just haven't had the chance to visit there. Canada, Canada too. But China's China's seems to be, you know, just so diverse. Um, you've got glacial mountains, you've got deserts, you've got, you know, places that look like Switzerland with their green forests and, and you know, rivers you can drink out of. Um, once you start to kind of get into the western part of the country, it's very empty. And, um, and that's kind of always those diverse places we try to find. And, uh, and yeah, of course, the cultures are amazing. You know, officially, China has like 55 minority peoples that live in China. But actually, in reality, there's like hundreds. Yeah. Um, and they all have their own languages and their own customs and beliefs. And in some cases, their own religions. And you bump into all these different places and all these different people every time you go out. And it's, uh, it's really breathtaking. Like we just filmed in China in March. Uh, for a show that'll be out next year, where we walked across a desert, and we were with um, we were with the local uh, Mongolian minority people inside China. So China has a huge population of Mongolian people, um, and we did the desert crossing with them and all their camels, and we had a big caravan, and and it was just a dream come true. Wow! Well, yeah. from seeing that to seeing the base camp of Everest, I imagine just that journey. You said it was sixty-five days. Yeah, the original motorcycle trip around yeah, China. Yeah, Yeah, 65 days, about 12, 13,000 miles. Um, yeah, and it was incredible. And, uh, you know, the fact that there's a road that goes all the way around China, you know, the fact that there's places to sleep, um, the logistics of how we did it, and the people we met along the way, it was just a, a dream come true. And my brother and I loved it so much. Then we did India uh, after that. So we did, so the, the, the China trip we're talking about is called Tough Rides China. Um, and then we did Tough Rides India, and India was mm -hmm. very hard, uh, very challenging. And then my brother retired from television, and he now has like a more normal life, and I stuck with it. Uh, and I did Tough Rides Brazil by myself, so I went all through the Brazilian Amazon, which was also really hard. That's Tough Rides Brazil. 
And uh, actually next year I'm going to start doing more tough rides, motorcycle shows. So we're going to get back into it. So I might do one or two next year. Oh, what? Two? Yeah, Potentially. maybe. Potentially. Um, yeah, it's great. There's a lot more interest in some of the things I'm doing. So there might be a chance to do, uh, do another motorcycle ride. Well, that's, that's awesome. I think it's so cool that you just have found not only your niche, but you, you take it all over the place from all sides of the earth. And, and I think what's really cool is so many people, you know, in 2019, we're so connected that we kind of have this mindset of, well, the whole world is known, but you kind of have this attitude of, well, yeah, but not to me, there's stories everywhere and I got to reveal them and uncover them. And I think that's, I think that's great. I think you just hit on a super important point. Like you have to stay curious. Like you really need to want to see stuff. You got to wake up every day and be like, my glass is half full. How do I fill it up today? And, and you got to want to go out into the world and meet people or go out into the world and see something. And, and that is how I wake up every day. And, you know, today I, we're having this call. I'm in Indonesia. Uh, we just finished filming here. So uh, today's my first day off. Uh, in a week from now, I go to Malaysia. We start filming again. Um, you know, I'll relax today, but t tomorrow I'm probably going to be like researching new places to go uh, online, trying to find out where to, you know, do my next motorcycle show or something. And and I'm just constantly curious to see more of the world and 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 meet more people because that's kind of what drives everything I do and what gives me the energy to you know to wake up every day and want to want to travel the world and and hopefully share those experiences in a positive way with you know, television audiences everywhere. I think, I think it's, it's one thing to travel, but it's another thing to want to share those journeys. Like I've turned into this kind of person where I don't do anything unless it's filmed. Like I don't okay. take, I don't take vacations. Um, you know, like I just want to film everywhere, everything like all the time. And, and I want to do it in a really professional way. Uh, and just when I'm filming, when I'm working, like I'm the happiest person I could possibly be. So I just want to, you know, keep making great content and keep trying to do it in a way that I don't see a lot of people doing it. This is an important point. Like I find, especially in the U.S. market specifically, there's a lot of leaning heavily on um, like the dramification of mm -hmm. some travel shows or nonfiction content, which I'm not a fan of. Um, you know, if the presenter is interesting and the location is interesting and the interactions and experiences that that person's having are interesting, you know, people should want to watch it and it should be okay, you know, to, to put on air or put on television. It doesn't need to be all this kind of creating of suspense and drama in an artificial way. So I really, I, you know, I worked for publications. I worked as a journalist for many years. It's really important to me that I go out and have like authentic experiences. Um, and that the audience gets that vision of what I'm seeing and doing in a, in a real way. And I hope people, you know, can respect that and, and follow it because it, I feel like that's something people are not getting at the moment. Yeah. Well, it sounds like through all these adventures, you're, you're not making shows and making stories. You're going out and finding them. Yeah. That's a really great way to describe it. And it, it seems like, especially even when, like you said, when you have a rare down moment, you're spending that time researching, trying to look for the next one. Yeah, because what I've done, what I've done, and, and I've been very lucky is um, since that first show in China where I rode the motorcycle all around China, no one wanted to work with us on that show. Uh, and and no one, no broadcasters wanted to work with us. No companies wanted to fund us or, or, or partner with us. So we did it by ourselves. And what happened was I ended up learning how to produce, direct, and present all in one show. Yeah. And, and now I do that for all my shows. So I don't know how to make television where I don't produce, direct, and present. And that's, that's good in one sense because now I have my own little like way of life and my own little bubble that I can live in. But the other way is like um, it allows me to have a lot of control over where I go, what I do, what I see. So because everything that comes out in the final product is mine or my vision yeah. of what I wanted to do and see. So uh, it gives me a great amount of control. So um, so that's great, but it also means I'm also doing all the research and doing all the planning and doing everything like that, which I love. So it, it's uh, it's great that I can be, you know, have a 360 degree experience with each production. 
I was going to say, it means you don't get a break ever. It means there's no such thing as work life balance. There's just, well, there's no work and there's no life. It's just life. There's no work. Like I'm in the fullest. Yeah. It's it. It's it. Like, I just don't feel like I need a break ever because it's, it's just nice to be able to travel and meet people and film and, and you don't really feel like you're being pushed by other people to do things. And, and you're just, uh, yeah, it doesn't really feel like work when you're, when, when I'm doing what I'm doing. So it's a very kind of a lucky uh, position to be in. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, just lo- looking at all your stuff, one, one of the questions I had written down before we got on this call was just going to be what, what drives you? Because for anybody to go out and do all of these adventures or anybody, even just to go on a simple hiking trip, you have to be just a little bit wild and a little bit crazy to just say, you know, I'm going to go out, out of my own home, leave the comfort of, of this nice contained space and just go see something new. It almost reminds me of like the Hobbit when I'm thinking of the, you know, going out your door, that, that whole thing. Yeah. Um, so what drives you? It, it sounds like what you've already hinted at, I would best describe as a positive mental attitude, curiosity, and just stubborn tenacity. Yeah, I think, um, I think the other thing that I've become slightly addicted to uh, over, the, over the years is, is wanting to learn more about myself and, hmm. uh, and wanting to put myself in interesting positions of, you know, mild discomfort. So, you know, I like trekking through jungles. I like climbing high mountains. I like walking across deserts because, um, because it's hard and it's uncomfortable. And I like to see where, how I react to all those situations. And we do it with a camera and I look at the camera and I speak honestly about how I feel. And, and I kind of enjoy that. And then when I've done what I've set out to do, when I've set out, you know, to do a tough goal and then I've accomplished it, knowing that I've gone through all those, you know, discomforts, it's a huge learning process and a huge kind of validation and a feeling of success because, because I feel like if you're look like the goal in life is to keep moving the needle, right? And you yeah. want to be a better version of yourself every day. You want to be a better husband, a better friend a better father mother whatever depending on your gender uh you know you want to be you want to continue to improve yourself on a regular basis and and i feel like you know the more of the world i can see the more i can put myself into uncomfortable situations to see something really unique or really special uh, or make a connection with someone who's you know really hard to find or really hard to get to is is kind of what i live for and going through all that discomfort and then being able to you know, bring that experience to an audience is, is what I really, you know, what really gets me going. Um, and I love it. I just, uh, it's, it's just my passion now. And do you think through that, I guess, triumphing over struggles and being in that discomfort, do you think it's just the vulnerability aspect of it? Just the idea of feeling kind of broken down and seeing what's left, like when you're really challenged and do you think that's, kind of summarizes that challenge i think i think you hit it like i think it's the vulnerability because when you go out on an adventure you can't control it like that's the definition of an adventure like you are not in control so therefore you're vulnerable and when you put yourself out into mother nature or you put yourself on a motorcycle in the middle of india or china or in the desert you know with sandstorms or up on a mountain at a high altitude you put yourself in a vulnerable place and, you know, and then you have to rely on, you know, your own intelligence, your own skill level, your own common sense to stay safe uh, and to be able to continue storytelling. And I think that that vulnerability and then being able to perform or execute your goal, you know, in that vulnerable environment uh, is amazing. Uh, but it's uncomfortable. It's challenging. It's difficult. Uh, but that's, you know, that's where the needle has to be. And, and most people that I've spoken with just, that doesn't interest them at all, but they love watching me do it or, you know, they, they don't want to, you know, put themselves out there in that way, or they've never thought that that would be for them, um, until maybe they had the chance to do something similar, you know, and then they turned out, they loved it. But for me, kind of pushing that, pushing that discomfort level has become just 
you know, what I live for. And, and, you know, I have to explain this to my mother a lot. She's like, what you do is so dangerous. I'm like, it's not dangerous. It's just uncomfortable. You know, yeah. are you willing to really deal with some discomfort um, in order to see something quite spectacular or meet someone quite amazing or, or have some kind of experience? And, and uh, yeah, I mean, I love the discomfort and I, I feel like that's that, that where that needle hits the discomfort. That's when I start to really grow and, and change and, and in a more positive way. Well, and you mentioned all the people who are out there just absolutely loving watching these shows and watching your adventures, but would never do something like this themselves. Sure. Do you think people who are adventurers and people who are non adventure do you think there are distinct lines there? Or do you think there's kind of a spark within all of us that just needs to push to the next level and you're just pushing it way further than most? Um, I think there's a spark in everyone. You know, I met, uh, there's this, there's this man in Indonesia who wrote me on Instagram a couple of weeks ago. He said he watched my show last year. Um, and then he decided to travel to Nepal and, and then go hiking to Mount Everest base camp. And he said that that my show motivated him to do that. And I was like, wow, like coming from Indonesia, you know, he had grown up at sea level basically his whole life and, you know, island life and tropical. Uh, and somehow through watching my show, he wanted to go trekking to the Nepal base camp. And that was like the push that got him to kind of go through that experience. And that's amazing. Um, and I, I guess there's other examples of that, but that's the one that's coming to mind at the moment. And, and, um, and yeah, I, I don't think there's a, a line. I just feel like people need to unlock this part of the brain that tells them that that's maybe not for them because, as long as you're physically fit, and what I mean by physically fit is, you know, can you walk on a treadmill for an hour without stopping? Yeah. You know, that's, that's all it really takes because if you, if you have that basic level of physical fitness, can you walk for an hour? Then the rest of it's just mental. Yeah. Like all of these journeys, I, like I'm not a professional athlete. Yes, I did play sports in the past, but like I'm not a ultra marathon runner. I don't run marathons in like two and a half hours. I would never be able to do that, but I can walk uh, and, and I can, and, or I can ride a motorcycle for days on end, you know, these kinds of, um, you know, strong mental experiences where you just have to focus uh, and pursue a, a path. These seem, these are things that I really like to do. And, and as long as you can, you know, have some basic level of fitness, then the rest is just psychological and you just keep moving. And, uh, and that's where I kind of get my thrill from. Well, it's amazing what the human body can endure. I, I yeah. am right. no yeah. athlete, but just the amount of times where you realize when I thought I couldn't do it or I had to quit and yeah, my body was tired, but that was an entirely mental decision. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I've read just recently, I've been kind of fascinated by um, some Native American culture, just talking about, you know, all the things that they did where they just kind of made up their mind to keep going and they weren't hampered by being in cold water or the winds or the storms that they couldn't control. And, and you're kind of embracing a lot of that same attitude, just, you know, take it on, bring it in your mind and, and, and get it done. Try. Yeah. I think, and, and there's a lot, you know, there's a lot to that because I feel like you, 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 you touched on this earlier, like the world is a small place, you know, we're all connected by social media, but, but disconnecting from that world and disconnecting from social media and disconnecting from your digital devices and going out into nature and having a real experience is still the best thing that, you know, could ever happen. And it's just so wonderful to really push yourself, you know, in those environments where where you're kind of out on the edge and oh it's just it's the best man and and i just want to bring more of that to people i want to bring that to people visually i think that's yeah. the best way to describe it well so through i guess really i have to just tell everybody watching um to just go watch all of these extreme treks to get the full story but is there a specific moment that you can think of i'm sure there are dozens where it was just things felt like they were just breaking down and crumbling and fall apart. And it was pure mental energy that got you to the next step. Oh man. I feel like every journey has, some, <laughs> uh, you know, Not bad. Yeah. I mean, cause you know, when you go, we go out for 10, 12, 14 days when we make an episode and, and 
you know, again, with an adventure, you can't control it. Um, there's going to be emotional ups and downs. Uh, there's going to be days where you don't want to move. There's going to be days where you feel like you're, you know, worth a million bucks and you're just cruising. Uh, there's going to be days when your feet feel heavy and your brain doesn't work. And, but that, those are the days you have to, you know, just keep fighting through, you know, we're at the end of the day, you know, our own personal progress is, is built up on, you know, by the culmination of days, we didn't feel like doing something and we did something because, Mm -hmm. you know, on a day where you feel great everyone's doing something on those days, right? It's yeah. the day where you wake up and you're like, I don't want to do anything today, but you can still find a way to be productive or, or you can still find a way to walk 10 miles or get up that mountain to that village that you were supposed to get to. You know, it's all these little goals about just about keeping moving. I'm a, I'm a real believer in, in just forward progress. And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, walking 20 miles a day or three miles a day, like you just have to keep moving forward. And, uh, the motorcycle journeys are, are a great example of this, where, where in China we set out to do like a, a 13,000 mile journey and every day we felt like we were just getting nowhere. But every day we were getting, you know, two, 300 miles closer to where we wanted to be. And we yeah. just had to keep fighting ourselves and our minds and, and continue to push. And some days we didn't feel like riding or some days, you know, there was a, you know, an almost, you know, incident or dangerous, you know, dangerous situation. We felt maybe like quitting, but you just kind of keep inching forward and you just keep doing what you set out to do in a lot of ways, especially for the trekking show that I make in a lot of ways, you almost have to turn off part of your brain. That's giving you feedback like so la uh, extreme trek season two, which is on Amazon prime and Vimeo. We walked a hundred miles across a desert in Western China near the border with Pakistan and China. And and I remember there was there were days where your mind is just like, why are you here? This is stupid. <laughs> like, why are you walking, you know, 15 miles a day across a desert for no reason? And it's almost like you have to just turn off that voice that's continuing to tell you what's actually happening and just plow forward uh, and just kind of put yourself in your own Zen moment. And, you know, find, it's in a lot of ways, my walking trips and my hiking trips and climbing trips are some kind of form of meditation where where all these voices that are in the front of your head just kind of move to the back and and allow you to actually see things in a much more clear way. Live in the actual moment, not the part of your mind that says, hey, it would be more prudent to stop and more and it, prudent to take a break. It's always more prudent to stop. <laughs> exactly. Um, but you're, you're right. Like it's just it's just a matter of wanting to um, to close off those parts of the brain that, you know, are, are complaining all the time or, or not getting it really done. And, uh, and it's, it's amazing once you kind of break through that feeling and you can have an honest to God, you know, experience. Well, you touched on something just a second ago saying that basically the, the real victories, whether it's travel or in life are when you don't feel like you can do something, but you keep going that we all have good days. And so accomplishing something on your good day isn't worth much, but those days where you feel like you, you want to quit and you keep going anyway, I, I think that's incredible. So to all the folks out there who are probably, I don't know, sitting on their couch, eating potato chips right now, those days where we're not accomplishing anything, what, I guess, what piece of advice would you have or what recommendation would you have to, to turn those zero days into positive days? Yeah, I, I think you just have to turn off that part of your brain that's telling you not to do something. You know, um, I, you know this'll, this'll, this will kind of give away my age, but I grew up watching Michael Jordan play basketball. Um, and I consider yeah, man, that number 23. Yeah. And I consider that to be one of the greatest, you know, um, experiences of my life is, is growing up in the Michael Jordan era. And Michael, you know, I remember listening to an interview he said one time and he said, you know, a good player can score 30 points any night when they're feeling good. But how do you score 30 points on a night where you feel like shit? Hmm. And, and, and he told me, he says, you know what? I got to get, I got to get three or four, you know, baskets or three or four shots every quarter. And then I got to get to the foul line three or four times every quarter. And even if I'm feeling terrible, that's what I got to do. And that's, that'll get my 30 every night. And the way he broke it down like that, where he's like, 
where he's like, okay, when I'm feeling good, I don't have to think about anything. I just, I'm just cruising. Yeah. But when I'm feeling terrible, how do I still get done what I need to get done? And he broke it down in such a plain and simple way. I need to get to the foul line four times. That's eight points. I need to get another, you know, four or five shots. I'll probably hit three of them, you know, and that's what I need to do every quarter. And he just broke it down into such simple steps when he wasn't feeling it. And I just thought that's such a great way to, to, to be because, you know, on the days where you're just feeling terrible, you might have to break it down a little bit more cleanly. Okay, I got to get up early. I got to get that first meeting out of the way. Okay, what's after the first meeting? Let's take a, you know, let's take a break outside. Let's get some fresh air. Got to go back in and do something else. Got to make a pitch. I uh, got to pick up the kids, you know, like on the days we're not feeling it. Yeah, we need to break it down and make it a little bit more simple. Um, but you, you can't stop. And that's what I think, that's what I think is the really the dangerous moment in life is where we stop or change or let our minds or let our external environment force us to change direction. Uh, that's yeah. just not, not possible. Just break it into measurable chokes, chunks that you can just knock out and conquer. Right. Because when you're feeling it and, you know, when the jump shot's going, you know, you don't have to think and it's just rolling. And, the, and but all of life isn't like that. Yeah. You know, you're lucky to get a couple days a month where you're feeling awesome, but you still have to wake up. You still have to do things. And, and I think that, you know, my shows and my trips of uh, these expeditions that I go on, you know, they've lent themselves to this kind of experience um, that goes way beyond just making television. You know, whether you're working for a sales company, whether you're an engineer, whether you're, you know, a, a, a stay at home mother, like you still have to, educate children you still have to teach you still have to you know do things for the household you still have to you know you st there's so much that needs to be done on a daily basis for all of us and uh and you know some days you're feeling it and it breezes by and other days you feel every minute go by and it just feels terrible but you still got to perform yeah and that attitude <laughs> it's kind of funny i was laughing have you seen uh what about bob bill murray movie yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> I just think like baby steps out of the office, baby steps. <laughs> but it's yeah. so true when you just apply it to, like these massive accomplishments, just breaking it down to just these little bits that you can you can really take charge of. Yeah, and and you know, it's not necessary every day, but on those days where you're struggling, yeah, breaking it down and 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 making everything bite sizes is, is really valuable. Yeah. There's a there's a quote I wanted to read you. So, uh so I love John Muir and John okay. Muir was a, you know, a naturalist and a environmentalist in the 1800s and early 1900s. He started the Sierra Club in the United States. He helped kind of form a lot of the national parks and he has this quote and it really sums up so much of what I try to do in my work. He says that um, thousands of tired, nerve shaken, over civilized people are beginning to find out that going to the mountains is going home. That wilderness is a necessity and that mountain parks and reservations are useful not only as fountains of timber and irrigating rivers, but as fountains of life. And uh, he said that in the late 1800s. So he thought that people were over civilized in the late 1800s, which I find amazing. Um, but that mm -hmm. quote really sums up so much about how I feel about the power of nature and how refreshing it is. And how, you know, how important it is to get out and have real experiences in nature and how that affects us all psychologically and physically. Yeah. 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 And just finding that peace. And like you said, that Zen moment of just detaching from the rest of the world and focusing on, you know, what's true and what's around you. Yeah. And, you know, we all can't be Alex Honnold and do a free solo of Al Capitan um, because that's crazy. Uh, I just watched that. It, <laughs> it was mind blowing. It was mind blowing. That man, that's one of the greatest athletic achievements in the world ever. Um, but, but you don't have to go that far to, to an extreme. Like you can just, you can just go for a longer walk, um, you know, get out into the amazing, you know, parts of nature that exist in the United States. I've been trying to film in the United States for years uh, and haven't been able to get a few projects off the ground, but, in the magical wilderness on the planet. And, and I want to show it off in, in my own kind of way by doing these multi-day 
uh, expeditions and ventures, and it just hasn't come to fruition yet. But I'm hoping soon um, I'll get the chance to come back and explore the U.S. a little more, especially Texas. All right. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Are you a motorcycle rider yourself? I I am not, but I have had so many people urging me to get into it and I've just put it off. And I think honestly, what has, what has kept me away from it is I live, I live in Dallas, but I spend so much time. I have to get out as much as possible, but I never take that into the idea of a motorcycle journey. And I so see so many people in Dallas just you know, wrecking sport bikes, going a hundred miles an hour, zipping on multi-lane highways. And for me, that's, I I like your style way better than that. Yeah. You know, go slow, enjoy the scenery, you know, see something beautiful, use your motorcycle as a tool to, you know, experience something pleasurable. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's amazing. A couple of years ago, I rode a motorcycle uh, from law from San Francisco to Los Angeles and Los Angeles to Dallas. Okay. Uh, and I went through, I went through California, Arizona, New Mexico, and then into Texas. And it was amazing. And, uh, that was my first real kind of adventure in the U S and I just remember having so much fun and how beautiful New Mexico and Texas were. And, and it gave me so many ideas for making shows and, and new content. And, uh, Hopefully I'll be able to get back someday soon. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, yeah. obviously the motorcycle treks, the motorcycle journeys have been a huge part of your show and just kind of what people associate with you. Do you think there is any other gear or equipment or anything? We tend to talk about gear and equipment, just reviews and stuff a lot on this channel. But do you think there's any other piece of kit that kind of, I guess, defines or aids in how you tell your story as much as the motorcycle or anything else that's influential? You know, we, you know, we try to film pretty minimally. Uh, we don't go out with a big crew. You know, we only have maybe one or two big cameras and I only travel usually with one or two cameramen. So we keep it very, very small. Um, and that's, you know, we don't want to scare people when we visit their homes. We don't want to freak people out when we talk to them on the side of the highway. Um, so that's always really important. If you watch my Tough Rides China show in episode four, my brother and I, we went to the border of China and Pakistan mm-hmm. and, and we got caught in a rainstorm, which turned into a snowstorm, which turned into both of us getting almost hypothermia. Oh, and nice. uh, yeah, and it's because we both didn't have rain suits. So as a motorcycle enthusiast uh, and a rider, after that trip in China, I always made sure I had a rain suit with me all the time because, um, because you need to keep dry. And a rain suit is great not only to wear when it's raining, but also to wear when you're a bit cold because it is airtight and it'll keep your heat in. And, yeah. uh, uh, and uh, you know, as far as gear is concerned, there's nothing better on this planet than a good rain suit. And also, too, a lot of motorcycles these days have heated hand grips. Uh-huh. And I highly recommend splurging, you know, the <laughs> extra couple hundred bucks or whatever it is for heated hand grips because when you do go up, you know, at altitude. And when I mean altitude, I I mean, Colorado, I mean, New Mexico, I don't mean necessarily Tibet where we were, uh, or the Himalayas where we were, but, you know, even going through New Mexico and Colorado, you know, it gets cold, you can get up a couple thousand feet, um, and your hands just freeze. Uh, and you know, being on a bike and being really cold is uncomfortable. So, you know, you definitely want to enjoy your ride. Um, you know, the hardness shouldn't come from discomfort from being on the bike. It should come from you know, the natural elements around you and hopefully you can be safe. But yeah, heated hand grips are really nice. Um, a good rain suit is really important. And uh, and another thing too, you know, for the people who do watch the show, it's important to know that we always have like a support vehicle, uh-huh. an, SUV, an SUV with us. And that's where the camera guys are. That's where all the hard drives are. That's where all the cameras are, the batteries, everything like that, which goes along into making that show. So for people who are watching it, you know, it's important enough for them to know it's not that we're totally unsupported. You know, we do have, you know, people around to, to help us. But I still think even though we have a support vehicle, we really go out there. Yeah. And, uh, did you watch Tough Rides Brazil? Uh, I've watched sections of it. I, I've watched the China stuff way more than Brazil. So I, I need I need to catch up on the Brazil stuff. There, are you watching it on Prime? Yes. Yeah, okay. 
there's a there's a scene in Brazil where we did like a thousand miles through the Amazon jungle in the mud, and it's all like knee deep mud, and it's terrible. And it was just me as uh, as the solo motorcycle rider, and then our support vehicle. And we we film a lot of the support vehicle stuff in that episode because uh, the the cars were just getting stuck. The car was just getting stuck all the time uh, in this knee deep mud, this red Amazonian mud clay crap, and it was awful. Um, but that really felt like we were out there too. And that was in a, that was a pretty wild adventure. Well, and it sounds like the support vehicle, it, it's enough to keep you going so that you can make it so that it's more likely than not that you complete it, but it's not necessarily to make it easier. It's to make the goal possible. And from what I've exactly. seen, there's probably a lot of spare tires in that thing. Yeah. Some spare tires, <laughs> but it, it's just to make sure that the camera guys are, you know, they're feeling you know, they have to have a totally different experience than I'm having. Like I'll be tired. I'll get heat stroke. I'm getting attacked by bugs. I'm falling in the mud. But to be honest, the guys in the car, they got to be jumping out of the car filming me yeah. every every couple hours or every couple minutes, depending on how bad the road is. And they need to be, you know, in a comfortable position. They need to be full of energy. They need to be feeling like they're in a safe environment. Whereas I'm kind of putting myself really out. Um, to, I'm very exposed. I'm very vulnerable. And, yeah. and, they, and they, you know, they can't feel like that or else they won't want to work to the level that they need to work in. So the car is super, super important. And then I'm just throwing myself out into the wild trying to, you know, get some good karma to come back to me. Well, that that's a really cool approach to it, too, because I've seen some guys who who are very into and what I kind of do on my little videos. But I know a lot of people who are very into self-filming stuff. And sure. yeah, there's some cool features of the minimalism of that but yeah. ultimately i think you identified the fact that the work in documenting documenting the story can't uh, can't hamper telling the actual story you can't be so tired of lugging a camera around that you can't do the next thing exactly you know i think if you want to create you know high quality 4k travel or adventure television you know, you have to be a storyteller, there has to be a narrative, and it has to be filmed in a professional, high quality way. Yeah. And that that's beyond just having a selfie stick and a GoPro or <laughs> a helmet camera or some drone that follows you, you know. Um, the Extreme Trek season two is a good example of that where we had a lot of drone work and we filmed it. Uh, that's probably the best series series we've made up until this point. Season three comes out later this year, and, and now we're filming another show called Expedition Asia for Discovery. And the quality, you know, just keeps getting better because we're getting so much better at storytelling and filming. But but you you can't skimp on on you know not having a dedicated camera person with you uh, who knows how to use a camera, who knows how to frame, who knows where to draw motion from, and and then of course the you know as an on camera talent, you know you have to be able to really look at a camera and speak to it. And really take what's inside and get it out in a in an honest way, and uh, and I feel like that's something that less and less people are doing on television these days is actually talking to a camera, talking to the audience, and actually telling them how they feel. Uh, you know, it's a lot of these interactive shows, and people are talking to each other and arguing and blah blah blah. But where's the? This is where I am at right now. Um, and I feel like that, that narrative is, is kind of gone. I don't know if it'll come back or not. Well, I mean, it seems like that's the root of everything you do is storytelling. Like, yeah, yeah there's great cinematography and, and cool environmental stuff and, and great production, but ultimately it's all storytelling. Yeah, I think, and it's the story of nature and it's the story of the culture and the people we're visiting. And then it, I always say that in my shows, I'm like the third presenter. Because we've got you know mother nature and the amazing environments and natural landscapes we're traveling through and then the second presenter of my show is always our local people that we meet or our local guides and then i'm just there to kind of drive the narrative or mm. or, or drive the story you know to where we need it to go so that there's a clear beginning and a clear ending and and i don't try to i mean you've seen the shows i don't overwhelm and and it's nice because um I, I've just always been a very objective, humble person. And when you take that out into the world as a traveler, you, you listen to people instead of talking over them. And you, 
you're genuinely curious about people's lives and, and, and their stories and what they have to offer. And it's nice to be able to sit back and let other people talk. It's nice to be able to sit back and, and learn about how other people live their lives without pushing any kind of agenda you know, onto them. And, and I think that's why I've been lucky with people like Discovery Channel and BBC for my shows is because is that kind of tone is maybe more of a journalistic approach, although I wouldn't say that they're you know, journalistic shows. Yeah. But there's definitely, you know, some elements of my journalism career that play into my television work as an, as like entertainment, but as trying to be, you know, just cautious of, of listening to people because I'm not an expert in any of these countries I visit. Uh, I'm not a PhD holder in like Indian politics or Indian history. <laughs> so, so when I go and film in India, you know, I'm listening to local people. I'm listening to what they say. I'm taking it at face value um and and trying to understand their way of life uh you know in the most respectful way possible so and even when you go to a country where you don't necessarily believe in all of their local customs or traditions you know you still have to be respectful of where you are because that's their way of life and you're the guest and you're the visitor and um i think from an early stage i decided that i was going to be a storyteller and not a uh, and not a um, an agent of change. Hmm. I think it. I think that you know when you when you travel the world, you I think you have to decide quite early if you're going to be an objective storyteller or an agent of change. Do you want to go places and you know make sure more girls are in school or make sure they clean up the environment or make sure they you know are you going to be someone who wants to change what you see? Are you going to be someone who wants to educate people in an objective way about what's happening in this part of the world? And I, I think I became an objective traveler and storyteller almost right away. Um, and that's really what I try to bring to my shows is just this kind of open mindedness about where we are and what we're seeing without trying to judge or change the way people are living. Hmm. Well, and that seems like a very scientific perspective to an art form, the idea of yeah. observing something without changing it. Well, you know, I, as, I think it's really rude to, to be a Caucasian North American and travel you know, to, <laughs> to parts of the world and somehow think that I know what's better for them than they know what's better for them. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's a way to, to live life, and I don't think that's a respectful way to, to, to go to other people's homes. And yeah, if people are asking for help, great. Um, if it's a government to government kind of connection, fine. But as an individual human being, if I don't want to create an NGO to, to affect change or whatever, if I'm just traveling, then you should be respectful and humble. And that yeah. really turns a lot of people off, actually, that point of view. Um, huh. uh, some people are thinking, no, you should be talking about this and you should be talking about that and you should be trying to change this. And it's not, it's not, I don't think it's necessarily my place. Um, I'd rather show you what's really happening and let you decide as the audience. Yeah. Well, um, and yeah. I think that maintains your authenticity for sure. I and mean, it so. absolutely shows through. Yeah. You, you try. I mean, you, you, go out, <laughs> you go out every day and you just try to have authentic experiences and make real connections. And, and you hope that, you know, you've done what you set out to do. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't like, we don't yeah. hit the nail on the head every time, but we've got a decent track record. We've made some good stuff. Well, and you touched on this earlier, but with your background in journalism, photography, public speaking, writing, do you feel like video in your current format is kind of the culmination and pinnacle of all of those things? Or do you still like working in those things as individual mediums as well? No, and I think I think it is the culmination of all those things. You know, when I was a photographer, I learned how to tell stories. I learned how to compose concepts and ideas and I learned how to compose frames and, and work and that. And then as a writer, I learned how to tell stories and that was really helpful. And then as a photographer and a writer about China, I started getting into public speaking and then that gave me the confidence to be on camera and really communicate my ideas on the spot, you know, as a you know as someone who was thinking in the moment but also delivering an idea or a concept in the moment and that really helped my brain work in that sense because all of our shows are unscripted like everything you see me say on camera was never written on a piece of paper by someone else or by me the night before 
Like it's all just flowing. Yeah. And public public speaking and dealing with Q and A's and dealing with people's questions and 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 arguing with people and stuff like that really helped me develop that in a positive way. So it's been. Um, and I feel like now the television presenting has brought in the storytelling, the public speaking and everything. And, and uh, it has been a culmination of, you know, these, um, you know, more than a decade worth of these multi genre based experiences that I've had at a professional level. And each phase of it seemed to dovetail into the next in a way that tells a story and gives a totally different perspective compared to it just being hyper focused on one of those elements. Yeah. And, 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 you know, writing the books has been great and being able to talk and give talks and give people a book afterwards and sign it for them and have them be able to take that home. And that's been really nice. And the photography books have been really, you know, something I value a lot because I spent so much time exploring China as a photographer. I, I did publish two books, uh, two Chinese photography books, one called Chinese Turkestan, which is all black and white shot in film. And another one called Sacred Mountains, which again was shot in film, but all in color. And that's all about Tibet, uh, where we filmed uh, quite a bit as well. So it's, you know, those have been very special to me um, personally, um, less professionally. They're not so popular these days, photography books, but but it was nice to be able to produce those and, and, and connect with people who appreciate that medium still. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, so right now you're you're in Bali working on this project for Discovery. Is there anything that you can kind of tell us about that trip right now? Yeah, so look, um, Bali is a very famous tourism destination. Uh -huh. um, you know, people all around the world know Bali. It's an island in Indonesia. It's famous for, you know, yoga and, um, you know, self-healing retreats. It's uh, got beautiful beaches. It's a famous surfing destination. All these things, you know, help make Bali a well-known uh, tourism and vacation destination around the world. And, and you know, people who follow my work might think, well, why is he in Bali? He should be in, like up on a mountain or in a desert in the middle of nowhere. But sometimes I really like visiting a popular place and showing it in a really different way. Hmm. So, you know, the island of Bali, which is in Indonesia, the country, uh, is a beautiful tropical island. It has volcanoes and rainforests and ancient villages and uh, unique ways of life that go way beyond where the tourists are. And, and for me, I wanted to take a place that has great name recognition like Bali and show people that you can go out and have a totally different experience there if you want. And so that's what we did. We went out and did this eight or nine day trek through these really remote parts, touching some tourist places along the way, um, but but really kind of going off the map and off the grid and hopefully showing people a, a much more unique experience And I haven't shaved yet. I'm still a bit hairy. I gotta clean myself up in a couple hours before I fly but um, But I think we did a really nice job here and and told an interesting story about a beautiful part of the world That's cool to take a destination that is well known but to go further to do more and just dive deeper That's great well, yeah. Well, you know, I, I love this. So in Extreme Treks, which you can watch on Amazon Prime, uh, one of the episodes is in Glacier National Park. Mm -hmm. Now, Glacier National Park is like the second or third most visited national park in the United States. Um, and, but, and I wanted to film there for years, but I didn't want to film in the summer when everyone's there. So we went in the dead of winter. And the park is still open in the dead of winter. Like no <laughs> one and, and so we went in March. And there was so much snow, there was so much snow in March that we had to park our van like two or three miles away from the, from the gate to go into the park. Oh, wow. Yeah, because they don't plow the snow or clear the roads in the wintertime, but the park is open. So we had to go in with snowshoes uh, and get up in, so we did, we filmed all through the southeastern part of the park, which is the Two Medicine Lake area. Uh, in southern Montana and we were there or northern Montana and we were there and it was Incredible, so you know again. There's this idea of having this name recognition of Glacier National Park, which is one of the ultimate nature destinations in the United States uh, But going there in a way that you know was totally unique and we, we, we were the only people in the park We didn't see anyone else we were there wow. for like six nights camping in the snow at, at, you know, well below zero in snowshoes. 
and we sh I think we showed off, you know, we showed people like Glacier National Park in the dead of winter that they've never seen before. And, you know, and, and tried to have a, a really unique experience there. So <clears throat> I was really happy with how that played out. And every now and then I'm looking for these opportunities to, to do something that people think they know, but then to show them it in a, in a totally unique and, and different way. That's that's incredible, especially in a destination well as well known as that. I was actually looking at this summer trying to plan a trip to uh, look at Arches National Park in Utah, and then I saw, and Angels Landing is the famous you know photo spot from there, and I saw this image of just people lined up the ridge, just this constant stream of people to try to get that one same shot on their iPhone. Yeah to try to just duplicate the same thing over and over again. So you showing a different view to something that's a, this known assumption. That's really cool. Yeah. You know, it's just you know, because of Instagram and all these other social media <laughs> platforms, we do live in a copycat culture yep. and, uh, and, you know, trying to break the mold of that, trying to tell the story, you know, in a different way, you know, going to a national park um, without a car and walking across it, you know, and, and sharing that experience or, you know, you just got to find a, a different way, you know, because the the nature is the story, you know, for almost everything I do, you know, nature and the landscapes and the way the landscapes change and the diversity, that is the story. So it's all about uh, trying to find, you know, a different way to explain that to people or visually tell that story. And, and I always find like walking is, is such a, is such a dramatic and dynamic way to show this because when you walk, you are connected to a place in a much more meaningful way than if you were to drive. Mm -hmm. You know, you feel you feel every footstep, you feel the weather change, you can see the flora and fauna changing around you. You know, it's a beautiful process that really binds you or connects you to a place. And uh, and it's some it's an experience that you don't get necessarily by motorcycle or by car. And uh, and it, and then when you're done, when you've accomplished what you've set out to do you you really feel like you know a place you really feel like you lived it and you spent time there and you're connected with that part of the world or that park or that environment in a in a really meaningful way that will stay with you forever and uh and you know that's the kind of experience we want to give people through through my show that each step along the way you touched it you interacted with it you're a part of it that's cool and it changed you and it and you know because you know you're not really changing the landscape but but you're using that landscape to tell you know a story and and also it has a monumental effect on you personally or it should you know if you yeah. if you're really living in the moment and trying to you know absorb everything you know one of the 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 most amazing people in the world to me are the people who do the Pacific Crest Trail in, in the in the western United States you know i think it's like 3000 miles it takes people like 3 months or 6 months to do it's ridiculous and but these people they go out and they do it and they just walk and to me these people like i would love to do the pacific crest trail someday um if i can find the time off but <laughs> it's uh but these people who kind of put themselves out there for months on end this is exactly what i'm talking about this kind of just selfless focused determination like day in and day out the job is just to walk and um and you've got to turn off the part of your brain that says Oh, this isn't good for like, you know, survival. There's a part of your brain, there's a part of your brain that only cares about survival. Yeah. Or and it's like, oh, this is uncomfortable, or oh, this isn't good for you, or you know, but actually it is good for you. It's just society has developed this part of the brain to tell you, oh, discomfort is not good. Discomfort is beautiful. Discomfort is the only way anything worthwhile ever happens. So embrace it, find it. Go out, grab it with two hands because, you know, if you just want to sit in your own little comfortable bubble, nothing will ever happen. Because nobody tells the stories when the weather was perfect and everything went exactly as planned. Right. And, you know, the games that Michael remembers most are the games when he had the flu or was feeling terrible and he still ended <laughs> up for 35 or 40 points. You know, it's, 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 these, it's the days you challenge yourself. Those are the days you remember the most i think and uh and you know living in an urban environment or living in western society or living in a rich country you know those days are hard to find so you need to you know you need to challenge yourself if you're an entrepreneur if you're a business person if you're a 
stay at home father or stay at home mother or whatever. Like you still need to find ways of finding those challenges in your day to day life, I think, or else everything just becomes really mundane. And then you, I think you lose your edge or you lose the sharpness to, to why you are living, you know, or why you are existing. Yeah. Cause I think That's... we're all, a lot of us just pull the fuzz over the eyes and, and, you know, just turn into zombies at some stage. Well, I think, I think yeah. you're offering an incredible perspective to get out, enjoy life to the fullest, make it hard, enjoy make it, hard. it, enjoy it, do something that's hard and then feel the reward afterwards. And if you fail, it's also okay. Cause failure is awesome. You know, yeah. you learn more through failure than, than success. You know, if your life is just a, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, trafficless highways, you know, you don't really learn anything. Um, you know, you learn more through failure than you learn through anything else. And, and the tough rides China was my first TV show. And, you know, we spent too much money. We didn't have a broadcast partner. Things didn't work out the way we wanted. Like we screwed up so many things, but through that process, I learned exactly how to do it. Um, and it's been a lesson that I could have, you know, I could have never experienced in any other way. You know, a lot of people think a lot of people suggested to me before I made television that I should go to like film school. Hmm. They're like, you need to go to film school. I was like, no, I need to make a film. Like I can spend like 50 grand going to film school or I can spend like 50 grand making a film. What's a better use of money? And I'm a firm believer, and this is going to piss off some academic institutions, but I'm a firm believer of just doing stuff because yeah. through doing stuff and failing, you learn way more faster than having someone tell you what to do. Yeah. And, uh, and if you're, entre- yeah, if you're entrepreneurial, if you're creative, you know, you need to put yourself in those pressure situations where you can make mistakes. And then once you make a mistake, you learn the correct path and you don't get that in a, in the confines of a, of an educational institution because educational institutions, they're safe places to fail, but the real world is not a safe place to fail. So you need to fail and make fast corrections and adjustments to be successful. And, and, it, and it can't always be safe. And that, that feeling of not being safe is what pushes you to be better. And you don't get that when everything around you is soft and cozy. You know, things have to be prickly. Things I love have, it. Things love have it. to be a bit challenging. And yeah. you, you are right on. And, and there's a graphic I saw a while back that was, what is it? Uh, like hard times make strong people, which make softer times, which make weaker people, which then, and it's just this continuous circle. And so you're endlessly pushing the limit of just go out, experience the hard times, be tougher, be stronger and tell the story. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, you know, this, this cuts across so many ways of life, like in business or in the way parents raise their children you know, or the way people are so protective of themselves nowadays, or, or they don't let their kids go out and play anymore or run around in the parks or, you know, the, the, the concept of like things are too dangerous. Mm. Um, you know, all of this over holding and this hypersensitivity to safety, you know, some of it is really important and some of it is value and some of it is just, you know, hypochondria and, and just fear of unnecessary dangers. And, and finding that right balance is really hard. You know, people are too much one way or too much the other way. And, but I'm, you know, I'm a firm believer of, of, again, just being uncomfortable and learning how to deal with that discomfort. And I think that makes, makes us all stronger human beings. And I think in our Western society, and I'm, I'm lucky because I get to travel all around the world and meet people all around the world. I can tell you that our Western way of life is really cushy. Yeah. Really soft. And, you know, we risk, you know, losing our edge in a lot of technology and in a lot of business and in a lot of, you know, advancements that we've been lucky to make over the last 50, 60 years, you know, in the North America and Western Europe, um, because our way of life has become so soft that no one's willing to kind of take those discomforts on and fight anymore. And, uh, and, you know, you see it in some business leaders and you see it in some, you know, entrepreneurs and stuff like that, but it's, you know, it's, it's becoming a, just a, a race to who can live a soft, who can live the softest life. <laughs> who can, well, who can have the car and the two car garage and, 
you know, the big house and, and then not do anything or, or not, you know, push themselves. And, and if that's your goal in life is just to live a really happy, you know, existence, then that's awesome. But if you want more, you need to, you, it's almost like nowadays, if you live in the Western world and you want to have a unique or different experience, you have to fight so much harder to find it. Well, I you think life I mean? is definitely about more than just trying to become a marshmallow and then die. <laughs> right. Right. Just stuff yourself full of as much food as possible. Like, can you imagine, imagine like the 1800s in the United States where, where you would come, like my family was from Europe originally, and then we came to Canada. But can you imagine like showing up in Boston or New York from Ireland or Scotland in the 1800s and then being like, okay, the city is already pretty developed. I'm just going to grab a horse and go west. And What's out there? We don't know. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and your whole life could change. You knew that was part of the United States, but you know, going from, going from New York to Oklahoma to Colorado to California, like that would be a life-changing experience. Um, and you might not make it, you know, and nowadays to try to find any sense of adventure, you know, it's so much, you have to work so much harder to, to find that sense of freedom or find that sense of, uh, connection with something other than an urban wealthy environment. You yeah. Know? It's, 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 it's interesting to, to play, to play that game of, of trying to live in like a place like New York or, or Dallas, Texas and and get out and try to really have a, an honest to God experience with nature. Yeah. It, and it's hard, but it's absolutely worth it. So for, for those who are wanting to see your discomfort and experience it and, yeah. and be better for it, you've mentioned the photo books, you've mentioned extreme check tra tracks on prime. What are other ways people can follow your adventures and see what you're up to? So I guess the best, you know, social media tool these days is probably Instagram. So you can find me at Ryan Pyle, R-Y-A-N-P-Y-L-E. You can get links to all my shows at ryanpyle.com. Uh, Tough Rides China, Tough Rides India, Tough Rides Brazil, Extreme Trek Season 1, Extreme Trek Season 2. Those are all on Vimeo and Amazon Prime. You know, if you're a Prime member, you can watch them all for free and it's awesome. Millions of people are watching on Prime nowadays. It's so, such a great medium. Um, you know, but, you know, through Instagram and through my website, you'll be able to follow me and where I am and what I'm doing. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, if the, the people who are listening to this podcast, I do a lot of talks in the United States and it'd be great to meet everyone and, and have a chance to connect. And if you like the shows and you like what I'm talking about, then, you know, it, it can be a fun experience coming out to a live event. That's awesome. Well, to everybody listening Go watch the episodes, go look at the photos, go experience the stories, get out and live it. Yeah. That's that's great. All right. Well, thank you for being on the show. It, it's been great. And to everybody listening, stay safe, be free, and never stop seeking adventure. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you.